Hey, 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 everybody. How are you doing? How was your week? Mine was pretty good. I got a lot of schoolwork done and I got some recording done for this episode. I got a 93 on one of my tests and then like an 85, I think, on the other. So I'm taking four classes, y'all, and it's the summer. So, ugh, school. It's fun, though. I also do this podcast and I do volunteer work as well. So I do stay pretty busy. I hope you guys enjoyed episode one and I'm ready to just get into this thing. This episode is going to be very interesting. And I have a question for you. How far would you go? Okay, so maybe Alicia Cara's version of How Far I'll Go by the movie Moana is probably not the best music I should play for this episode. But it's the first thing that came to mind so I'm sorry because this episode is pretty dark so let's get right into this From 1940 to 1943, you were the commander of the camp at Auschwitz. Is that true? Yes. And during that time, hundreds of thousands of human beings were sent to their death there. Is that correct? Yes. Is it true that in 1941, you were ordered to Berlin to see Himmler? Please state briefly what was discussed. Yes. In the summer of 1941, I was summoned to Berlin to Reichsführer Himmler to receive personal orders. He told me something to the effect, I do not remember the exact word, that the Fuhrer had given the order for a final solution of the Jewish question. We, the SS, must carry out that order. If it is not carried out now, then the Jews will later on destroy the German people. He had chosen Auschwitz on account of its easy access by rail and also because the extensive site offered space for measures ensuring isolation. How despicable. Am I right? Of course I'm right. I'm always right. Well, my husband would disagree, but then he would be wrong, right? So (laughs) I'm just going to go off on a little tangent here in just a second. But that clip is from the Nuremberg Trials which tried a bunch of Nazi officials and they had to testify about like their war crimes and had to answer questions and those kind of things pretty much be held accountable for their actions. So I just want to reflect here for a minute and reflect as humanity as a whole. We look back and we can see such atrocities from humankind. I mean, it's not just the German folks at that time. I mean, in the US, we've had slavery and other countries have had slavery as well. There are governments that oppress their people. You look at Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, China. You look at wars that countries have had. You look at war crimes, etc. Even Jim Crow laws and things like that. Like, why do people treat other people in despicable ways? Like, there's really no excuse for that. Now, I, like I said, we can look and we can see that, you know, if we really look at the Holocaust... It really didn't happen that long ago. It really didn't. And when I think about this, I think about my great-grandmother. We called her Grandma Rangi because that was the last name. Shout out to all the Rangis that are tuning in. Whoop, whoop. I love you, family. You guys are amazing. And so Rangi, yes, very German name. But her great-grandmother, so that would be my fifth or sixth great-grandparents, came to the United States from Germany. So before the Holocaust even happened. And my grandmother, she lived to be 94 years old. She was born in 1920. So she She would have been like a young teenager when World War II was going on. And I just think about all the things that she must have seen in her lifetime. Born in 1920, so she would have experienced World War II, the Great Depression, Jim Crow laws, and then other wars that went on, the Cold War, Vietnam War, Korean War, Gulf War. And I just sit back and I think how much just in the span of 94 years she saw. And these things, they just didn't happen that long ago. And I reflect and I think, why are we as humans treat other humans in ways that we shouldn't? The golden rule is treat others the way that you want to be treated. But there are times where we just don't do that. And that's kind of what we're going to get in today. And it's more about the excuses that we use. In this case, it's I was just following orders, right? So let's kind of dive into this a little bit. 
Back to the Nuremberg Trials. This was the Nuremberg War Criminal Trials. Now, their defense often was based on obedience, that they were just following orders from their superiors. And we're going to play other clips, and you're going to hear this over and over again. Now, this was held for the purpose of bringing Nazi war criminals to justice. Now, this was a series of 13 trials carried out in Nuremberg, Germany. That's why it's called Nuremberg Trials between 1945 and 1949. So my great-grandmother was alive during this time. It is also important to know that this was widely televised and one of the first war crime trials ever attempted. I want to sit back and think that maybe she would have tuned in and watched this, but anyway. So now the defendants, they included Nazi party officials, high-ranking military officers, along with German industrialists, lawyers, and doctors. And they were indicted on such charges as crimes against peace and crimes against humanity. Now, we all know that Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, he committed suicide and was never brought to trial, which, what a horrible human being. Like, he just went and offed himself so that he wouldn't have to face justice, which just really, really shows how much of a coward he is. Now, although the legal justifications for the trials and their procedural innovations, they were very controversial at the time, they really were, but it was really a milestone toward the establishment of a permanent international court and an important precedent for dealing with later instances of genocide and other crimes against humanity. So yeah, it was very controversial and it's really interesting because you look at the, the panel of judges at the Nuremberg trials and their prosecutors and defense attorneys according to British and American law, but the decisions and sentences were imposed by a, a tribunal, which is like a panel of judges, rather than a single judge and jury. So the chief American prosecutor was Robert H. Jackson, and he was an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And each of the four allied powers, they supplied two judges, a main judge, and an alternate. So it's very interesting. It's really cool to see a bunch of countries come together in order to execute justice. There were 24 individuals who were indicted, along with six Nazi organizations determined to be criminal. So, for example, like the Gestapo or the Secret State Police, the SS. So, there was one man that was indicted and he seemed to be medically unfit to stand trial. And then there was another man who killed himself before the trial. And then, of course, we know that Hitler killed himself and actually two of his other top associates, Heinrich Himmler... And you will hear his name a lot in the clips that I'm going to play. And Joseph Goebbels, yeah, they both just committed suicide before they could be brought to trial. So two cowards, <laughs> along with Hitler himself. Now the defense, they were allowed to choose their own lawyers. That's common. You know, that's a, the legal and right way to do it. But the thing is, the, the most common defense strategy was that the crimes defined in the London Charter, which, you know, that's... The British law, remember, they're going off, or off of British law and American law. They were examples of ex post facto law. And that pretty much is that the, law, the laws that criminalized actions committed, that they were committed before these laws were drafted. So they're pretty much saying, oh yeah, that law came into place after we committed these crimes. So it doesn't apply. I'm rolling my eyes right now. <laughs> Another defense was that the trial was a form of victor's justice, that the Allies were applying a harsh standard to crimes committed by Germans and leniency to crimes committed by their own soldiers. So pretty much they were saying, well, you know, even though we like mass murdered all these people in um, these camps, the British and the Americans, y'all committed war crimes too. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we um like murdered a bunch of civilians, you know, at this time. <laughs> during this war. So as the accused men and judges spoke four different languages, there was a intro of technological innovation, which is definitely taken for granted that we have today, which now we have instantaneous translation. Back then, IBM, they provided the technology and they recruited men and women from international telephone exchanges to provide on-the-spot translations through headphones in English, French, German, and Russian. So, I will post videos of these, the clips that I use, because, I mean, the Nuremberg trials, there's a bunch of videos and it goes on. It's very long. Did you yourself ever feel pity for the victims, thinking of your own family and children? Yes. How was it possible for you to carry out these actions in spite of this? 
By all these in view of all of these doubts which I had, the only one and decisive argument was the strict order and the reason given for it by the Reichsführer Himmler. Now, in the end, the International Tribune found all but three of the defendants guilty. Can we just give a round of applause? Twelve were sentenced to death, one in absentina, and the rest were given prison sentences ranging from ten years oof, to life behind bars. Ten of the condemned were executed by hanging on October 16, 1946. Hermann Göring, he was Hitler's designated successor and head of the Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force, committed suicide the night before his execution with a cyanide capsule he had hidden in a jar of skin medicine. So I'm assuming he probably didn't want the publicity of being hanged, but... Yeah, another coward. Also, later on, and I'm going to play a clip from another guy who was put to trial later, because, well, there are other trials following these trials. These were really the hallmark, the cornerstone of seeking out those that committed these war crimes that were major Nazi leaders. And one of those guys was Adolf Eichmann. Of course, uh, the uh, definition of the categorical principle would be rather difficult because in the times of Kant, the orders of the superiors had not been as destructive and as lethal as later because there was no precedent. Uh, when I was acting, it was in the time of war and in the turmoil of war. In those turbulent times, I couldn't but obey and I had to comply with my orders. So far as responsibility is concerned, responsibility could only be shouldered by my superiors. I was only a small official receiving orders and couldn't shoulder any responsibility or assume any responsibility. Now his story is very interesting and he's another coward but not in the way of the ones that committed suicide. After the war he actually fled. He ended up in Argentina. Actually there's a really good book that I have. It's called Hunting Eichmann. It's pretty much about the story of them trying to find him and bring, bringing him to Israel to stand trial and face the crimes that he committed. And it took them years and years and, and surveillance and planning and capture of him. And yeah, it's crazy. But check out that book if you're interested in, in a good read. But anyways, the biggest thing that you will hear in these trials in the defense of the accused is I was just following Orders. Tell the tribunal what you understood this order to mean. The order meant, in my own opinion, that it was desirable in the case of the sinkings of merchantmen that there should be no survivors. Can they why it is that you are giving evidence in this? Yes, sir. Because when I was taken prisoner, it was claimed that I was the author of these orders, and I do not want to have this charge connected with my name. Think about that. I was just under the authority of someone else. It's not my responsibility. Even though I committed these horrible things against another human being, or human beings, I should say. They would not take responsibility for their actions. So that brings us to what we're going to kind of dive into today. This influenced one of the most famous studies of obedience in psychology. And it was carried out by Stanley Milgram. He was a psychologist at Yale University. And he conducted an experiment on the conflict between obedience to authority and personal conscience. In 1963, he examined the justifications for acts of genocide offered by those accused at the World War II Nuremberg trials. These trials really got him to think, you know, were they really just following orders? Why are they not taking responsibility? You know, why are they just using that as an excuse? Like, probably like what we're all thinking, like, okay. So, these experiments began in July of 1961, which was a year after the trial of Adolf Eichmann. So, he, he pretty much devised the experiment to answer the question, could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were really just following orders? Could we call them all accomplices. He really wanted to investigate whether Germans were particularly obedient to authority figures, as this was a common exclamation during the 
World War II for the Nazi killing. He was interested in researching how far people would go in obeying an instruction if it involved harming another person. And he was also interested in how easily ordinary people could be influenced in committing atrocities, for example, the Germans in World War II. So now the experiments. We call this <laughs> Milgram's experiments. And so what he did was he, he actually put out a ad in the paper, <laughs> in the newspaper, advertising for male participants to take part in this in this study but he didn't tell them the actual what the actual experiment was he said that it was going to be a study about learning at Yale University which is a flat out lie mm -hmm. now the procedure was that the participant was paired with another person they drew roles to find out who would be the learner and he would be the teacher. Now, this was fixed, by the way, because the participants that answered the ad were, were paired up with one of Milgram's confederates, so they were just pretending to be a participant. And so he fixed it to where the participant that answered the ad would be automatically the teacher. They would always be the teacher. So the learner, which was the confederate that, that Milgram called Mr. Wallace, was taken into a room and had electrodes attached to his arms, and then the teacher and the researcher went into a room next door that contained an electric shock generator and a row of switches they marked from 15 volts which is like a slight shock to 375 volts which is danger a severe shock up to 450 volts which in my notes it just says xxx which i'm assuming is like extreme pain now, any electricians, you guys probably know more about that. Um, I am very embarrassed because my husband works in the electrical maintenance field. So I'm going to actually consult the expert on this. I'm going to ask my husband. All right, so expert reports that... It really depends. Yeah, wonderful answer. Uh, what he did say is that it really depends on how long you hold it. But if you were actually electric shocked with like 400 or, or 450 volts, it's really going to hurt. And he even said that he knew someone that got shocked at that amount of voltage and they had to go to the hospital right away and they were still shaking so it would really hurt. Now I also did consult Wikipedia as well just to see what it said. Well, according to great old Wikipedia, it really depends on a lot of different variables. So the current, the duration, the pathway, how high the voltage is. This is over about 600 volts, but I mean, that's in addition to all those other conditions. If you have any medical implants, pre-existing conditions, and your age and your sex. So anyways, these people were pretty much, yeah, that was their options. Now, getting into the procedure is going to explain this a bit more. Now, the volunteers, they were recruited for this experiment. So, the participants, they were 40 males. They were aged between 20 and 50. And their jobs ranged from unskilled to professional. And they were all from the New Haven area. Also, they were paid $4.50 for just showing up. Which I guess is pretty cool. Back in that time, that might have been a lot of money. But <laughs> was it worth it, y'all? Was it worth it? And we're going to get into that, too. So, at the beginning of the experiment... They were introduced to the other participant who was a confederate of the experimenter. That's when they drew the roles and they were fixed to be the teacher, right? There was also an experimenter. He was a guy dressed in a lab coat, but he was actually just an actor, you know, and he comes into play a lot during this experiment. Now, there were two rooms in the Yale Interaction Laboratory. They were used, one for the learner with the electric probes. And then the, another room for the teacher experimenter with the electric shock generator. So now the learner, Mr. Wallace, was strapped to the chair with the electrodes. After he has learned a list of word pairs given to him to learn, right? So here, study these words and the pairs. The teacher, which is the participant, has to test him by naming a word and asking the learner to recall its partner from the list of four possible choices. So, you know, 
The word is rain, and the four words are summer, winter, spring, and fall. I don't, I don't know, you know. And he has to answer the correct one that he learned. And he is told to administer an electric shock every time the learner makes a mistake. Now, every time that a mistake is made, he has to increase the level of shock. Now, remember, the participant thinks that this is a study about learning when really it's about obedience. <laughs> there were, 30, like I said, 30 switches on the shock generator from 15 volts to 450. Now, the learner gave mainly wrong answers on purpose, of course, because this is part of the experiment. And for each of these, they had to shock them. And when, whenever the teacher refused to administer a shock, the experimenter, the guy in the, in the gray lab coat, looking all cool and whatnot, being all professional, was given, I mean, remember, he's an, actually an actor, was given a series of orders to ensure that they continued. Now, there were four probes, and if one was not obeyed, Mr. Williams, Mr. Gray lab coat, he read out the next one, and so on. So it'll be 195 volts. Now just picture yourself in this experiment and think of how you would react, how you would respond, how the pressures of being under this authority would affect you. Would it really make a difference? If these people are put under pressure of authority, like, oh, you have to do it, you have to continue, you have to keep going, you, it requires you to go. And then when, of course, Mr. Grey Lab Coat is like, you know, I'll take the responsibility, then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll shock them. So, this is what I'm going to get into the results here. 65%, y'all, which is two-thirds of the participants, continue to the highest level of 450 volts. And every single participant continued to 300 volts. In the clip, you probably heard the guy complaining of heart trouble. And remember, this is like not. He's, they're not actually shocking someone. It's pre-recorded. It's just set up to make them think that. So the guy can, complains of heart trouble. And another thing is when they reach a certain level, I think it is at 300 volts, that the learner, so the guy that's hooked to the electric trobes, stops responding. So literally, they start naming off pairs, like, you know, the participant, the word and the pairs, and they get no response. And then they're told, okay, you have to shock them. He's like, you, just imagine if, you, if you're part of this experiment and you're getting giving shocks to someone and then they stop responding like what wh what like are they dead are they okay like the one guy in the clip said you know that guy's hollering he's hollering he sounds like he's in pain well i mean if someone was really getting shocked with that much voltage they probably would be so now milgram he did more than one experiment he actually carried out 18 variations of this study and we'll get into those a little bit and what he did was he altered the situation which is the independent variable being all sciencey here using big words to see how this affected obedience, which is the dependent variable. Am I taking you back to high school? You probably learned that in like elementary school when you learn about experiments and hypotheses and all that fun stuff and the scientific method, right? Good old stuff. We still use it today. So with this, there is a conclusion that Mr. Stanley Milgram came to. Hold on. 
to your britches. Ordinary people are likely to follow orders given by an authority figure, even to the extent of killing an innocent human being. Wow. Obedience to authority is ingrained in us all from the way we are brought up. Isn't that crazy? So people, they tend to obey orders from other people if they recognize their authority as morally right or legally based. So this response to legitimate authority is learned in a variety of situations. So in the family, at school, in the workplace, etc. Now we're not saying that obedience is a bad thing, not at all. And... <laughs> We'll, we'll get into that a, a little bit more of the criticisms of Milgram from other people. But he, he summed up in the article, The Perils of Obedience. He wrote this in 1974, and this is what he stated. The legal and philosophic aspects of obedience are of enormous import, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple experiment at Yale University to test how much pain an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to by an experimental scientist. A Mr. Gray lab coat. Stark authority was pitted against the subjects, the participants, strongest moral imperatives against hurting others and with the subjects' ears ringing from the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Diving into this, Milgram, he did explain the behavior of his participants by suggesting that people have two states of behavior when they're in a social situation. Now listen up, y'all, because this will be very important to remember. And, you know, maybe I'll test you. Maybe I'll make you take a quiz. You know, who knows? Because I will use this in later episodes. Especially, there are other, mm, maybe not experiments, but other things that have happened, other events. And I just want you to remember this. So now, the, the first state of behavior is the autonomous state. Sounds very fancy, right? So this is when people direct their own actions and they take responsibility for the results of those actions. So that would be in, like in that cl the first clip that I played when the guy's like, I'm that guy's hollering. I'm not going to take responsibility for this. He was at that time in the autonomous state because he felt like he was going to be responsible for the outcome. The agentic state this is when people allow others to direct their actions and then pass off the responsibility for the consequences to the person giving the orders. In other words, they act as agents for another person's will. So in that first clip, after he said, uh, you know, that guy's hollering, I'm not going to take responsibility, you know, whatever. That's when the experimenter would reply, oh, I'm going to take responsibility for everything. That's when the participant would shift to the agentic state and be like, oh, okay, I'll continue. Now, Milgram suggested that two things must be in place for a person to enter into this agentic state, right? So number one is the person giving the orders is perceived as being qualified to direct other people's behavior so that they are seen as legitimate, okay? Number two is that the person being ordered about is able to believe that the authority will accept responsibility for what happens. This is called Milgram's agency theory. So th this is called the agency theory, and this is supported by some of the aspects of Milgram's evidence from his experiment. So, for example, when the participants were constantly reminded that they had responsibility for their actions, almost none of them were prepared to obey. In fact, many participants were refusing to go on. They only did go on if the experimenter said that they would take the responsibility. So, just think about that. Now, we did talk about how Milgram had many variations of this experiment. And so obedience was measured by how many participants shocked to the maximum 450 volts, which was about 65% in the original study, like I stated. Yeah, so in total, 636 participants were tested in 18 different variation studies, meaning, you know, they changed one aspect of the procedure to see how it affected obedience. The independent 
and dependent variables. The first variation was a uniform. So, of course, we have Mr. Williams, Mr. Gray Labcoat, as I call him. He was a symbol of authority, right? Because he wore the gray lab coat. He was seen as a scientist and professional. And so Milgram carried out a variation in where at the start of the experiment, the experimenter, Mr. Gray lab coat, received a phone call that pulled him away from the procedure. And in his absence, he was taken over by an, an ordinary member of the public, you know, a guy in ordinary clothes, to order the participant to continue. And actually having the guy in ordinary clothes telling the participant, it actually, the obedience level dropped to 20%. <laughs> so big, big drop there. Another variation was the change of location. So instead of the original impressive Yale University, they moved the experiment to a set of rundown offices. And this actually showed that the obedience dropped to 47.5%. And so this pretty much suggests that even the status of a location can affect obedience. Next is the two-teacher condition. So when a, a participant could instruct an assistant to press the switches, 92.5% shock to the maximum of 450 volts. So this pretty much goes to show that when there is less personal responsibility, the obedience increases. So this relates back to Milgram's agency theory. So just imagine you're the person sitting there with another person and you are told, you know, you're supposed to shock them every time, but really you don't press the switches. You tell the other person, okay, press the switches. This is just showing that there's more obedience when you're not the one actually pressing the switches. There was another variation and this one I, I didn't see the, in the video and I'll post it. I didn't see this one played out, of course, this was a variation, but this is called the touch proximity condition. So now I guess they had a point where the teacher, you know, the participant, they had to force the learner, so Mr. Wallace, they had to force his hand down onto the shock plate when they refused to participate after 150 volts. So now when they were forced to do this, their obedience fell to 30%. Now, this is because, remember, they were in two different rooms. The The participant could only hear Mr. Wallace's screams and cries for help. They couldn't actually see them. But in this part, they had them in the same room. So now this is, so the participant is no longer buffered because they, before they were protected from seeing the consequences of their actions. And because of this, they, they had to see it happen right in front of them. And that made them go, oh, no, no, this is horrible. Like, well, it's horrible all along, but there's also the social support condition. So they had two other participants, which are just feeling Confederates, like they were part of the experiment. They were told to refuse to obey. So the first Confederate stopped at 150 volts and the second one stopped at 210 volts. This showed that the presence of others who are seen to disobey the authority figure reduces the level of obedience to 10%. Now, I really want you guys to remember this. Remember the social support condition because I don't know if it's going to be next episode. Maybe I'm hinting at something where there's another social experiment that the social support condition really comes into a play. Okay, so just also remember that. Mm -hmm. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So then there's the absent experimenter condition. This says that it is easier to resist the orders from an authority figure if they're not close by. Instead of the experimenter, Mr. Gray Labcoat, being in the same room instructing and, uh, and prompting the participant to shock them, they would be in a completely other room and they would be on the telephone telling them to shock them. And this is when obedience would fall to... 20.5%. So many participants, they would cheat and they missed out on shocks or they gave less voltage than ordered by the experimenter. The proximity of authority figure affects obedience. Even though these experiments are pretty radical and um, show a lot of evidence, there were some critiques. Now, a lot of people that criticized these experiments. One thing that they brought up was, oh, it was conducted in a laboratory type of condition. The question was, we must ask if this tells us much about real life situations. We, like, we obey in a variety of real life situations that are far more subtle than instructions 
to give people an electric shock. If you have kids, which I always, side note, I always joke that I have two kids, a husband and a dog. You know, they count. Husbands, you count. Dogs, you count. And you tell your kid to do the chores. Sometimes they obey, sometimes they don't. Maybe you're told to do your homework. Maybe at work you're told to do a task and you obey. These are like subtle things that we do so that we obey. They're not as extreme. And this sort of situation that Milgram investigated would be more suited to a military context. Which, you know, I can agree to that and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more because we brought up wars and stuff earlier and this whole thing the whole reason for this experiment was because of world war ii that's what inspired milgram to investigate this would ordinary people actually follow orders of an authority figure is it just a wartime thing so in a writing orn and holland in 1968 they accused milgram's study of lacking experimental realism. You know, maybe the participants might not have believed that the experimental setup they found themselves in was maybe they just thought that maybe the person on the other side wasn't really receiving the electric shocks. And maybe it's more truthful to say that only half of the people who undertook the experiment fully believed it was real. Maybe the maybe two thirds disobeyed, you know, the experimenter. There is that criticism of, oh, well, maybe they didn't actually think that it was a real thing that the person was really being shocked. However, I would disagree with that criticism because of the effects of the people in the experiment. And we're gonna, gonna dive into that a little bit. Another thing was that his sample was biased. This I can definitely agree with because, I mean, one, all the participants in his study were male. Do these findings transfer to females? His study also cannot be a representation of the American population because his sample was self-selected. Remember, he got participants from responding to a newspaper ad. And so maybe it's just typical of people that have that volunteer personality. Their, their argument, their criticism is that maybe people with different types of personalities would respond differently, right? Maybe it's just this volunteer attitude that would respond in this way. And yet, a total 636 participants were tested in the 18 very 18 separate experiments, but they were only in the New Haven area. They they weren't seen as being a reasonable representative of a typical American town, which, you know, that I can agree to. It's not like he selected participants from all across the United States to participate. Milgram's findings, they have been replicated in a variety of cultures and most led to the same conclusions that Milgram's original study came to. And in some cases, they actually saw higher obedience rates. But there is a criticism that the majority of these studies have been conducted in industrialized Western cultures and that we should be cautious before we conclude that a universal trait of social behavior has been identified. Now with this study, there obviously were ethical issues, like to the extreme. And the first one we know is deception. These people, these participants thought that they were actually shocking a real person. No, but, you know, Milgram did argue that the illusion that is used, it's necessary in order to set the stage of the revelation of the study. And, you know, and it's necessary to conclude of certain difficult to get at truths. So he's pretty much justifying, well, I had to lie to these people because the whole part of the situation was that they had to think that this person was actually being shot. Now, a good thing is that Milgram, he did interview all of the participants and he did debrief them all after the experiment and he did let them know that this was actually not a experiment about learning it was actually about obedience and apparently 83.7 said that they were really glad to be part of the experiment and only 1.3 percent said that they were bitter like they wished they weren't involved <laughs> Yeah. Another thing is that the protection of the participants is a ethical issue because they were exposed to extremely stressful situations in this experiment. And that 
in itself may have the potential to cause psychological harm. And remember last week I talked about the limbic system a little bit and the body's fight and flight response to fear. And it's kind of the, it's kind of like the same when it comes to stress. Like you're secreting the hormone cortisol, your body is responding to this level of stress. And you could see that many of the participants were visibly distressed. They had signs of tension, so trembling, sweating, stuttering, laughing nervously, biting their lips and digging their fingernails into the palm of their hands. And actually, three of the participants, they had uncontrolled seizures. Yeah. And many other people, they pleaded to be allowed to stop the experiment. And Milgram actually notes that there was a businessman that was pretty much reduced to a, quote, twitching, stuttering wreck. In Milgram's defense, he did argue that these effects were only short term. And like I said, he did debrief them after the fact. And once he told them that these people were not actually shocked, you know, their stress levels decreased. He actually, up to a year after the experiment, he would interview the participants. And um, these follow-ups, he did these follow-ups to make sure that there was no long-term harm on these people, psychologically, health-wise, whatnot. Now, when he did debrief them and he did follow up with them, he did let the participants know that, you know, their, their behavior was common, which is kind of sad that their behavior is common because I'm sure after the fact you know or during the experiment they felt really guilty and were obviously in distress so another ethical issue was the right to withdraw now with any experiment like as a participant you do have the right to withdraw and the bps they stated that researchers should make it plain and up front and plain to the participants that they are free to withdraw at any time regardless of payment so the question is did milgram give participants an opportunity to withdraw because you have to remember some of them they wanted to withdraw and because of the experiment and the type of experiment it is they were given those commands of you know that they have to continue and whatnot and he argues that they were justified because the study was about obedience and that the orders were necessary. And he pointed out that although the right to withdraw was made partially difficult, it was possible as 35% of the participants did choose to withdraw. So there is that. Now, like he said, he talked about, or the question was brought up about this being more appropriate in a military setting. I'm going to bring up something that's called the My Lay, My Lay? massacre this was during the vietnam war guys and this was the mass murder of 347 to 504 unarmed citizens in south vietnam almost entirely civilians most of them were women and children and unfortunately this was conducted by u.s soldiers and this was on the 16th of march in 1968 so some of the victims they were raped beaten tortured or maimed, and some of the bodies were found mutilated. Now, the massacre did take place in the hamlets of My Lai, My Lai? Lai? I, I cannot pronounce, I'm sorry, and Mai K of Som Mai village during the Vietnam War. Now, of the 26 U.S. soldiers that were initially charged with criminal offenses of war crimes for these actions, only one, which is William Colley, was convicted, and he was sentenced to life in prison. His sentence was reduced to 10 years, but then he was released after only three and a half years under house arrest. Now, the incident prompted widespread outrage across the world, and this is what really reduced the U.S. domestic support for the Vietnam War. Now, three American servicemen, Hugh Johnson Jr., Glenn Ad Adridota, and Lawrence Colburn, they made an effort to halt the massacre and to protect the, the wounded. They were sharply criticized by U.S. congressmen and received hate mail, death threats, and mutilated animals on their doorsteps. 30 years after the event, their efforts were honored, which is good. But like at the time, these were people that went against what everyone else was doing. I was trying to do the right thing. And because they weren't treating people in atrocious ways, they were threatened and everything. So I guess that also brings up the question of, of Milgram's experiment. Like be the social support variation that he had in his experiment. Some people would argue about these things 
things, but you know, there's also like during other wars, the torture and prisoner abuse, things like that, and how we conduct ourselves. I do want to bring up something that is really important because like I told you guys, I was in the military and those that have served, they, they more commonly know about this and it's called the Geneva Conventions and they are four treaties and three additional protocols that establish international legal standards for humanitarian treatment in war. Now, this this actually came to play at, in the aftermath of the Second War War. And this updated the two, two terms of the two 1929 treaties and added two new conventions. So the Geneva Conventions, they extensively define the basic rights of wartime prisoners, so civilians and military prisoners of war, and this established protections for the wounded and the sick and provided protections for civilians in and around a war zone, and it also defines the rights and protections afforded to non-combatants. The treaties of 1949 were ratified in their entirely or with reservations by 196 countries. So this does only concern combatants and war. They don't address the use of weapons. That's actually subject to a completely other convention. Yeah, so the Geneva Convention, it's great because they this was established because of World War II. Because of the excuse of, I was just following orders. And those of us that have served, you know, we raise our right hand. And we submit to the authority of the officers appointed over us, the President of the United States. But there is a, a clause. There is like in the fine print. So we are told to submit to the orders of the officers appointed over us, the President of the United States, right? So we have to follow pretty much every order that we're given. And we are also subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And we, we they can file like charges on us for not obeying an order. However, there is a clause to this that any order that is unethical, illegal, or immoral, that we do not have to follow it. So this, this is also, I believe, protected by the Geneva Convention, especially when it comes to like prisoners of war and that kind of thing. So now the rules of the Geneva Convention, they apply only in times of armed conflict and it seeks to protect people that are no longer taking part in hostilities. So I mean, if we take prisoners of war, they're technically no longer a threat. So now not all violations of this treaty are treated equally. The most serious crimes are termed grave breaches and they provide a legal definition of of a war crime. Grave breaches of the third and fourth Geneva Conventions, they include the following acts committed against a person that is protected by the convention. So the willful killing, torture, or inhumane treatment, including biological experiments, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, compelling a protected person to serve in the armed forces of a hostile power, and willfully depriving a protected person of the right to a fair trial if accused of a war crime. There are also considered grave breaches of the Fourth Convention, which are like taking of hostages, extensive destruction and appropriation of property that's not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully in Guantanamo, and the unlawful deportation, transfer, or confinement of parties. So that's the Geneva Convention. And I think it's really cool that now as military, us and those across the world, are given these standards. Now, these are only people that are part of the convention that follow these rules. So obviously, if you were a military member and you're captured by an insurgent or like guerrilla type of group, they more than likely will not follow the Geneva Convention. And so it's like good luck if you're a prisoner of war. <laughs> so definitely maybe not fair, but the majority of governments, they do follow this convention. So what do you think? How far would you go if you were in Milgram's experiment? And I know we're going to sit back and we're going to think, oh, you know, I would never do that. I, I would refuse. And But really think about it. Maybe think about a time that maybe you were really pressured into doing something. And maybe it's not to like the extreme of, of course, shocking someone. But maybe you felt a conflict in your conscience about something, whether it's like a religious thing or maybe you saw something as immoral or maybe you just didn't want to do something. But just think about it. How far would you go? And also sit back and, and think about the atrocities that in humanity we have committed against others.
You can share your thoughts on our Facebook page at WT Psychology. You can send us an email at WT Psychology at gmail.com. You can send us a tweet at WT Psychology. Hit us up on Instagram at What the Psychology. Our host podcast platform is Anchor, where you can listen to us on, which is anchor.fm backslash WT Psychology. And we are also streaming on other main podcast platforms like Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Radio Hub, etc. I am open to any suggestions, any ideas, anything you want to learn about. Just let me know. I am your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you're listening to What the Psychology. Stay psyched, y'all.